let us begin. And last week, two weeks ago actually, we began with chapter 8. And as I mentioned, in chapters 1 to chapter 7 on the book of Romans, what is very interesting, in seven chapters, the Holy Spirit is mentioned only once in Romans 5, chapter 5, chapter 5 verse 5. Then, in the shift in chapter 8, suddenly, we hear the Holy Spirit over roughly about 20 times in one chapter. So obviously, Romans chapter 8 really focuses on the Holy Spirit. So, for us to better understand, again, uh, uh, the, the role of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life, I want to have a quick rundown from chapters 1 to chapter 7 of the book of Romans. Because, as you well know, in chapter 8, verse 1, it begins, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So, I want us to go to, from chapter 1, how Paul was building his case. Okay? So, let's start in chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, where Paul was simply introducing himself, and then he tells his readers what he is writing the letter for. He says in verse 16 and 17, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then to the Gentile. 17. For in the gospel, by the way, the word gospel means good news. For in the good news, the righteousness of God is revealed. So, right from the very beginning, in chapter 1, if you still recall, this was nine months ago when we started the study, Paul says that in the gospel, the righteousness of God, not the righteousness of Joe, not the righteousness of Marie, not my righteousness, but the righteousness of God, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. So what is he saying? Everything about the gospel is all about faith. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Verse 18 is the shift. So he introduces and says that the, that the gospel is about righteousness of Christ by faith. And then in verse 18, he shifts and says that everybody is under the wrath of God. Verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness <clears throat> excuse me, of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now, this verse alone, uh, some people might say, oh, Paul is talking about them because they are godless, because they are wicked. But Paul wants to make sure that the reader will include himself to this group of people who are godless and wicked for which the wrath of God is being revealed. Next verse, uh, verse 20, sorry. Because remember, there were a lot of Jews in the readers. So the Jews were actually uh, prioritizing the obedience of the law. So Paul clarifies what the law is all about and what it does and what it does not do. Therefore, verse 20, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. So nobody uh, can be made righteous. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sins. So here, from the very top, Paul explains that the purpose of the law is not to save you, it's not to save me, it simply tells us and uh, makes us realize that we are law breakers. That is the reason why Verse, chapter 1, verse 18 says that the wrath of God is upon us. 21 to 24. Again, uh, Paul just clarifies the purpose of the law um, and all about the, the law. 21. But apart from the law, that means excluded, take away the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. 22. The righteousness, here's the key word, is, what's the word? Given. Given. So righteousness is not attained. Righteousness is not something you strive for. 
Righteousness is not something you can work on. Righteousness is not something you can buy. Righteousness is given. And anything that is given, our responsibility is to receive, right? I mean, if it's given to you, you need to receive it to be yours. So verse 22, the righteousness is given through faith. That's the means by which we receive this righteousness. Through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So it's exclusive. This righteousness is not given to everybody. It's offered to everybody, but only those who believe in Christ receives the righteousness of God. There is no difference whether Jew or Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all, here's the key, all are justified freely by His grace. I mean, freely is clear enough. But to add by His grace, that means it, it's something that is free, and yet you do not deserve it. None of us deserve it. So what is, the, what is the context? The righteousness of God that is given to godless people, to people who are evil, freely, because we do not deserve it, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So as we can see here, right from the very top, chapter 1, all are condemned, all deserve the wrath of God. Chapter 3 is the shift that justification is by Christ and not by the law. Because the law simply makes us conscious of our sin. So that is the end of chapter 3. Chapter 4 is basically an illustration. An illustration of what kind of faith is the faith that saves. Because there are so many kinds of faith. In the word faith, it simply, mean, simply means believe. And believe is illustrated in the life of Abraham and in the life of David. Now, if you recall, in chapter 4, uh, Paul explained that Abraham was made right before God, even before the law was given. So what was Paul's uh, point? The law had nothing to do with God's righteousness, because there was no law. Okay? And then in the example of Paul, Oh, sorry. In the example of David, Paul also illustrates that even David under the law was also justified and made right, not because of obedience to the law, but because he believed in God. So the whole of chapter 4 is the illustration of what it truly means to be saved by grace. So let's move on. What does chapter 5 talk about? So we are done with the justification by faith in Christ, chapter 3. Chapter 4 is the illustration of that faith. Chapter 5 is what do we have since we are justified? Chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, conclusion, okay? Because we have put our faith in Christ. Therefore, since we have been justified, how? Through faith. Not by works. Through faith. What's the result? We have peace. Here's the key word. With God. Peace with God. Which means, which means, again, just a reminder, that once upon a time, we were enemies of God. And the only time we had peace with God was when we were justified and received the righteousness that comes by faith through Christ. That was the only time when we had peace with God. I want you to remember this because later on, I will be putting this out again and remind us that once upon a time, we were enemies of God. Because a lot of people think, by the way, that somehow we are automatically loved by God. That somehow we are automatically liked by God. And somehow automatically, you know, we have the favor of God. That is not true. Originally, by default, we were enemies of God. No matter how, how good we think we were. And the peace with God came through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, here's another key, we have gained access, access to what? Access to God, by faith, into this grace in which we now stand. Brothers and sisters, right now, as people who have put our faith in Christ, who have received the righteousness of Christ, 
we can stand before God because we have the righteousness of Christ. Not because we are obedient to the law, but because the righteousness of Christ was given to us. In which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Chapter 5, verse 20 um, is, is, is a controversial verse because there were a lot of people who misunderstood grace when Paul said this in chapter 5, verse 20. Remember, the whole of chapter 5 is saying we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, not by the law. It is what Christ has done on the cross. Then in chapter 5, verse 20, Paul says, the law was brought in so that trespass might increase. Remember this topic? That the purpose of the law is not only to make us conscious of sin, but the purpose of the law, the second purpose, is so that we will be aware of all our sins. Then the last line is the quote-unquote controversial line because Paul says, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Now, it is sad that there were people who would take this verse and say, aha, uh -huh, so we are saved by grace. And the more sin we do, the more grace. Therefore, let's sin more so that grace will increase. So that is the logic that people were thinking. And so they were making it a license to sin because they say that we are saved by grace anyway. We are not saved by the law anyway. So let's continue on sinning because grace increased. That was chapter 5. Chapter 6 brings that out and Paul explains about the grace issue. Chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Basically, Paul was putting himself in the shoes of those people. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Verse 2, Paul answers the question that he thinks people were thinking. By no means. We are those who have died to sin. Again, the emphasis, we are dead to sin now. How can we live in it any longer? So what is Paul trying to say in chapter 6, verse 1 and 2? Well, yes, it is true we are saved by grace through faith. Not by works. It's not obedience to the law. But it is not an excuse to sin more. As a matter of fact, Paul is saying, because we are dead to sin, we should sin less. As a matter of fact, the question that he put out here, how can we live in it any longer? It really sounds like, guys, since you are dead to sin, you really should not be sinning anymore. Totally not sinning anymore. Now that again brought somehow a little confusion because now people who are truly been born again, been made righteous in the sight of God. And so when Paul said we should no longer live in it any longer, they feel guilty because many true Christians still fall into sin. So let me first uh, uh, bring out chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, where Paul explains the doctrine of imputation. That means the transferring. Verse 3 and 4 says, Don't you know? that all of us who were baptized into Christ, that means joined into Christ, Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Don't you know that? Paul is saying, this is what happened, that you were baptized into Christ Jesus and you were baptized into his death. Then verse 4, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. Let, let me stop there for a moment because this is a major Christian doctrine. Remember, the penalty of sin is death. death. So since we have sinned, therefore we need to die because the penalty of sin is death. Every single one of us have sinned and therefore the penalty of sin is death. So this verse 3 and verse 4 of chapter 6 is the doctrine of imputation. That is your sin and my sin were baptized into Christ, were joined into Christ. So when he died on the cross, technically speaking, 
you and I have died along with him. That is what made you and I righteous before God because our sins have been forgiven because Christ have carried our sins upon himself and actually paid the penalty of our sin. Do you see that, that line? In order that, okay? In order, for the purpose of, just as Christ was raised from the dead, to the glory of the Father, here's the last line, we too, as we Christians, may live a new life. So here again, Paul in chapter 6 emphasizes that because we are in Christ, therefore we need to start living a new life. What kind of life? A life that is obedient to the law. Now, remember, when, when Paul says this, again, there were a lot of people who feeling guilty because I am expected to start to live a godly life. And yet I find myself always falling into sin. This is now where chapter 7 comes in, where Paul says and balances the situation. Yes, we are made righteous because we have received the righteousness of Christ. But then in chapter 7, verse 19 and 20, Paul says, Ay, ay, ay! I do not do, I do not do the good I want to do. But the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. So oh no, what, what in the world is happening? Verse 20. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, okay? Here's a very interesting line. Paul finally makes uh, points somebody else. It is no longer I who do it. I <laughs> Take note, Paul is saying, I want to do what is good, but I keep on doing what I do not want to do. So therefore, if I keep on doing what I do not want to do, it is not I. Now that is, that, that is kind of confusing. I want to do, but I do not do. It is no longer I who do it. So who does it? The last line but it is sin. He personifies sin as if it's a person, but it is sin. He pinpoints. It is sin living in me that does it. Wow. I mean, you really have to read these verses again and again to really make you understand that technically speaking, there are two eyes in every person. The new I, the new man that wants to serve God and do good, and the old I, which is my body, who wants to go against it. And that where sin lives. Now, verse 24, 25. So because of this dilemma, because of this dilemma, Paul says, What a wretched man I am! How pitiful! I, 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 I'm in a battle every day. Then he asks the question, who will rescue me from this body? Literal, sarki. Okay? Who will rescue me from this physical body where sin dwells and that is subject to death? Again, a reminder, brothers and sisters, your body is dying, but the real you is alive. So he asks the question, who will rescue me? You know what's interesting with Paul? He, this is a really a rhetorical question because when he asks the question, he himself answers the question. Verse 25, ma, verse 25 says, Thanks be to God. So who, who will rescue him? God will. Who delivers me? How will God rescue me? Through Christ our Lord. Then he makes a conclusion. Take note of this conclusion. Very important. So then, conclusion, right, Jim? So then, here, here's my wrap up. I myself, who's that I myself? The real me, the new, the new Mike, the new creation, the new me, I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God. But in my sinful nature, in my body, am a slave to the law of sin. <laughs> 
So what is Paul saying? Brothers and sisters, listen to this very carefully. Every Christian, every person who has been made righteous in the sight of God have two components. Every single one. No one is excused. The first component is the real you. The one that has been made perfect in the, in the presence of God. We are now standing positionally perfect in the sight of God. Hebrews 10, 14. For we have been made perfect. Okay, that is the first component. The second component of what makes us us is our body. And we, the real me, the real Mike, is still living in this body. So those are two components that we do have. And these two are in collision in an everyday regular basis. Then we start with chapter 8 from two weeks ago. This is all review okay? so for, for us to better understand because chapter 8 is very, very important for a believer. Therefore, therefore what? Well, therefore from the previous things that I have talked about. Well, what did I talk about? You were condemned. You were justified in Christ. You now stand in the grace of God. You now have a conflict in yourself because you are a new man and still living in an old body which is in conflict. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now take note, this verse happens immediately after he says in chapter 7 that there is the new self and the old body. And yet we are no longer condemned. You know why? Because God looks at the real you, not our bodies. Because our bodies will be redeemed in the near future. Let's take a look. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ, the law of the Spirit or the workings of the Holy Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin or the workings of sin and death. What is that? Sin and death no longer have any grip on us. Then from last week, last week, chapter 8, verse 9, 11, 9 to 11. You, however, that is you are in Christ, you have been made righteous. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh. Yes, we still live in this body, but the real you and the real me no longer is in the realm of the flesh. Because flesh, sin and death no longer have any grip on us. But rather, we are in the realm of the Spirit. And you know what, you know what I love from Paul? He, he always puts a condition. Because people who were reading this letter, they might all presume that they are all Christians. That's why the, the middle line. You live in the realm of the Spirit if, okay, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. Which basically he's saying to the group of people that he was uh, speaking to in, in, in the church in Rome. Yes, these are all true. You are no longer condemned. If, if you truly, indeed, uh, the Spirit of God lives in you. Which means the opposite. If the Spirit does not live in you, then what? You are not a believer. And that he explains in the last sentence. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. I mean, that's very obvious. So, verse 10. But, if Christ is in you, then even though, I love this one, even though your body is subject to death because of sin. In other words, even though you are struggling with sin in this body, okay, even though the Spirit gives life what life? Eternal life. Why? Because of righteousness. What righteousness? Because I'm good? No. Remember? No one can obey the law. So what righteousness? The righteousness that God gave, that we have received. How? By faith in Christ. So you see the sequence now? All the way from chapter 1, all the way right down to chapter 7, and then now in chapter 8, Paul clarifies how we receive the Spirit. Verse 11, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, 
the conditional, if that is really true, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. That is where we ended last week. So remember this last verse of verse 11, because as we read verses 12 to 17, which Paul will start again with the word therefore. He refers to the previous verses, okay? So take note, what does verse 10 and verse 11 says? That if you have the Holy Spirit, then you are in Christ. And if you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit who is in you has the power, the kind of power that rose Jesus from the dead. That's very powerful. It's living in you. So now let's go to verse 12 to 17, which is our main text for tonight. Verse 12 says, Therefore, <laughs> there, there again, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. 16. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So there you go, uh, verses 12 to 17. And these are all connected. Remember, this is a buildup of the case all the way from the start in chapter 1. So um, before we go any further, for those of you who are in this room and you have not gone to chapter 1, Please go watch all the videos from chapter 1 because it builds from one to the other. Okay, and let's take a look here. Let's break it down. Are you ready? If everyone is ready, thumbs up, please. Ready to hear? Okay, here we go. Verse 12. Therefore. Okay. Therefore. So what is therefore? Well, remember, he was talking about having the Holy Spirit in us. The Spirit who has the power to raise Jesus from the dead. In other words, a very powerful Spirit. Why is he very powerful? Because the Holy Spirit is God himself. Therefore, and then he calls upon the attention by saying, brothers and sisters. You know, here's the first time Paul calls them brothers and sisters. You know why? Because he wants to have this camaraderie. That the thing that you are going through, this collision of the new self and the body, the sin that is colliding that we face on an everyday basis is something that you and I, brothers and sisters, are going through on a regular everyday uh, situation. But chapter seven, uh, chapter eight begins with, but you have the Holy Spirit. So what is it? Therefore, therefore, everybody ready for this? Therefore what, brothers and sisters? This is a very important verse for those who are in Christ, okay? Very specific, this is for the, for the people of God. Brothers and sisters, what? Okay, Paul, we are ready. What is it, Paul? We have an obligation. Now, that word obligation is a very strong word. Oblige, obligation, has to do. And I asked Mr. Webster, what the word obligation means. And here's what Mr. Webster says. Obligation is an act or course of action to which a person is two things, morally or legally bound. We have attorney Borja here, uh, who is a lawyer, and he is very familiar with these terminologies. Oblige, you must. Morally and legally, those are the two grounds to which we are obliged. Morally, legally, it is a duty or commitment. 
Then I went to check out what are some synonyms to the word oblige or obligation. And Mr. Webster says, responsibility, function, task, job, chore, assignment, commission, business, and charge. Gusto ko unahin si Mami kasi she keeps on get, telling ahead of me. So kaya ko binilisan yung last two words. Okay, but the point is, it is something that one must do because we are obliged. So the question is, you and I, what are we obliged to do, brothers and sisters? What are we obliged to do? First Paul begins with the negative. We have an obligation. Then he says, but it is not. So this is not. This is where we are not obliged. We are not morally and or legally bound to do. It is not to the flesh to live according to you. In other words, we are not obliged to sin because sin no longer have any grip on us. So therefore, what is Paul saying that we are obliged to? Well, in the context, we are obliged to obey God. That's the context. Let me tell you now. How in the world are we going to oblige? How are we going to obey God? How are we going to implement this as a person who have been, uh, uh, who have received the righteousness of Christ? How are we going to implement this? First Corinthians chapter six. Paul writes the church in Corinth. Now, by the way, the church in Corinth have a lot, have a lot of problems. Okay. So in verse 19, he says this to the church, to the congregation in Corinth. Do you not know? Are, are, are you not aware? You don't know? Do you not know that what? Aha! Uh -huh. Your bodies, this physical body, don't you know that your bodies are temple? Now, what's the word temple? Basically, a residence. A, pl a, a place where one dwells. Who dwells? Of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, as Paul have used those words, brothers and sisters, let me just explain this for a little bit. Because sometimes we do not appreciate so much of what God has done. Yes, we appreciate that Jesus died on the cross for our sin. And we all say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. But oftentimes we neglect the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit, on his verse, have made his dwelling in where? In our body. Yeah, the temple, our bodies. But what does Romans say? Who is in our body? Yeah, in this verse, it's the Holy Spirit. But who else is in his body? Sin. Now, we, we need to take note of this. Sin is living in this body. And yet, God chooses to dwell and stay and live in this same body where sin is also at. I want you to think carefully about that. Do you see now how much God loves you? That even though this body is the, uh, quote, unquote, as far as God is going to remember, God is holy. God is perfect. God is sinless, and yet he would live in a body that is deteriorating by death because of sin? This body, this body right now, this body, this sinful body right now. The only reason why he dwells in you is to help you and I combat the temptation of sin. But it's like telling that you know, I will live in the dirtiest, junkiest place because that is where you live to accompany you. The new man, the new you and me live in this body, but God chooses to live along with you and I in this worthless, deteriorating, uh, mortal bodies. If not, if not clear enough, where is he living? In you. God is not walking somewhere in the distance. You know, sometimes when we pray, we love to pray and look at the heavens and look at the stars. 
oh, Heavenly Father, okay, or Jesus, you know what? Next time, why don't you look at yourself? Lord, the Holy Spirit is living in us. That has to sink in. Who is in you? Since when? Whom you have received from God. So when did you receive him? Well, at the point of conversion. At the point where you receive the righteousness of Christ. At the point where you have repented of your sin and put your faith in Christ. That is the same time that the Holy Spirit says, Okay, time for me to go in and live with you. In you. The next line, very important. Very, very important. Everybody, take a look at the screen. Take a look at the screen. Very important. You, who say you? Brothers and sisters, right? The brothers and sisters, remember? You are not your own. Several ways to interpret that. Number one, you don't own yourself. Number two, you are not alone in yourself. You are not your own. You see, here's the problem. Even as Christians, sometimes we think that our life belongs to us. And so we only think of the external things that we can give to God. God, I will give you my, uh, my car, my house, my... No, no, no. God says, you are not your own. If I may bring you back to chapter 6 and chapter 7 of the book of Romans. Once upon a time, we were slaves to sin. So who owns us? Who owns us at that time? Satan. Sin. Yeah, Satan owns us. But then, here it says, you were bought. Remember, slaves are being traded, exchanged, and bought. You and I were bought. Verse 20. You were bought at a price. What price is that? The death of Christ on the cross. Now, how much are you? Oh, man. That is how much God loves you. You see, we have to understand that. You were not bought with a million dollars. I mean, if somebody... You know, um, how much, I don't know the pricing, <laughs> if there's a price at all. Attorney Borja, I don't know how much in the Philippines. What if you had a hit and run, okay? And not hit and run, you hit and you were able to kill a person. What is the uh, um, monetary liability? In the Philippines, no, no evidence, no receipt, no proof, 100,000. Okay, if with proof and everything, how much? to depend on the social standing of the person, his earning, uh -huh. his financial okay. uh, standing, okay. etc., etc. Those now, are counted. 100,000 pesos, Philippines. Roughly about $2,000. I have no idea how much is it in the U.S. Because you are now liable for the funeral, li liable for everything, okay? And the compensation for the family. Now, let, let us say... $100,000. Okay, let's say $100,000. But you and I were bought by the blood of Christ. Question, how much is that? Priceless. You see, sometimes we don't understand the value of you. Sometimes you and I are the one putting ourselves down. But Christ was willing to pay the price for you. That's why we need to... We, you, brothers and sisters, you are valuable. Priceless. Now, because we now belong to Christ, we are now slaves of Christ, we were bought by the blood of Christ, then what? Therefore, therefore, so here's the result. Because Christ bought us, therefore, honor God. Let's stop there. Therefore, honor God. What does it mean to honor God? What's another word for honor? Worship God. Another word for worship. Glorify. Glorify God. You see? Praise. Praise. Huh? And, uh, what, why? Praise. Praise. Praise God. Now, sometimes, you know, when we come and say, okay, let's have praise and worship. But we do not know the reason behind why we are worshiping. Sometimes we worship because, well, you know, God deserves the glory. God deserves. But you know why? Why? 
if there's any one reason that you will want to have when you worship the next time, it be, it's because he paid for you. Because he owns you. And so how do we honor God? Ma, read the text. Do not create. What does it say? How do we? With our bodies. You don't just honor God and say, Lord, I thank you, I praise you. I mean, mind. No, we honor God with our bodies. That is very important. You know why? Because this body, sin dwells, is controlled by the enemy. And so if you take what the enemy controls to worship God, I mean, that is amazing. The real me already wants to worship God. I really have, the real me process wants to do good. But this body wants to do the opposite. But if we use our body who wants to do the opposite to worship God, that honors God. Does that make sense, everybody? Yeah. Okay. So let's go back. We're still on verse 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, an obligation to honor God with our bodies. Verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. So he's just making a statement. If you're a person who have no Holy Spirit and your mental capacity and your thinking, your everyday lifestyle is still to, to obey sin, then you will die. That's just a fact, a reality. You are not a Christian. You will die. But if by the Spirit, or if in the context, but if you live by the Spirit, here's the result. You put to death the misdeeds of the body. In other words, that if you are truly in Christ, there is this battle, and that battle is something that we desire to win in a regular basis, not just because we have a new self, but because the Holy Spirit who has the power to resurrect Christ from the dead, is living in you and in me, and because we have the obligation to worship him because we were purchased and bought by his blood, and we do not own ourselves. And so if you live by that, by that uh, principle, you will live. You have the Holy Spirit. Verse 14. For those who are led, this, oh, you know, Paul just keeps on building. Um, for those who are led by the Spirit, in other words, if you have the Holy Spirit, if you are uh, uh, you know, uh, guided by the Spirit, and the Spirit lives in you, if for, you are led by the Spirit of God, uh, for those who are led by the Spirit of God, are the children of God. Now, let me emphasize this. We, not everybody in the world are the children of God. Okay? There's no such thing as, we are the world. We are the children. The question is, whose children? Whose child are you? Because only those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. Now, let me show you in the book of John, where John explains how a person becomes a child of God. John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. In verse 11, John says, he, Christ went to his own, the Jews, but the Jews rejected him. Then in verse 12, he says, Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, so there are two things, to those who receive him, to those who believe in his name. Now, please take note, the word receive and believe is not simply, I believe in the word Jesus, in the name of when it says believe and receive, it's the totality of who Jesus is. They receive him as the Messiah, the promised Savior. They believe in him that he is God became man. So that's the whole totality. So to those who did this, receive and believe, here's the result. He gave, that's Christ, gave the rights to become children of God. That is the only time for which a person becomes a child of God when the realities of receiving and believing happens. And if it's not clear enough, 
Paul wants, uh, I mean, John, who wrote the book of John, says, children of God, children born not of natural descent, not in the natural, not in the physical, nor of human decision or a husband's will. No, not the physical. What is it? But born of God. Now, if you read in the, in the book of John, this is chapter 1, and we jump to chapter 3, in chapter 3, Jesus actually have a conversation with a Pharisee named Nicodemus. And Jesus says this in John chapter 3, verse 3 and verse 7. In verse 3, Jesus says, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, Nicodemus, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. In verse 7, he repeats himself and says, You should not be surprised at my saying. You must be born again. Now, brothers and sisters, a lot of people have this confusion about the word born again. They think born again is the name of a church. <laughs> or it's a denomination. Or it's the kind of worship. Oh, mga born again yan. You know, they are born again because they are jumping and shouting. No. Born again have nothing to do with the denomination or the style of worship. Born again is the technical terminology for which a man has received the Holy Spirit, has received the righteousness of Christ, has repented and believed in Jesus. That person has been born again. So let's go back to Romans 8, verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Verse 15. The Spirit you receive you did not work for the Spirit. You did not just get the Spirit. You did not buy the Spirit. You, what did you do? Receive the Spirit. Why do we receive? Because it has been given. Okay? So you, the, the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves. What does it mean? Well, again, in the context. What is the context? Slaves to sin. So the Spirit no longer makes us slave to sin. In other words, sin no longer can have any rights or grip on us. And therefore, if sin have no grip on us and the penalty of sin is death, therefore, we will never die. Right? That's why in John, again, Paul, Jesus says, to those who believe in me, we'll never die. Then he says, here in this line, the spirit you receive doesn't make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Fear in what? So I will no longer, you know, uh, uh, wear a t-shirt that says, no fear. <laughs> what does it mean, no fear? In the context, no fear of having the penalty of sin, which is death. No fear of ever going to hell. No fear of ever being condemned by sin. That is why Romans 8 verse 1 begins. Therefore... There is now no condemnation to whom? For those who are in Christ Jesus. That's why a true believer and who truly understands his position in Christ and what Christ has done on the cross have no fear of death. Now, I'm not saying you don't have fear of being eaten by a piranha or eaten by a shark or, you know, uh, lying down on a deathbed. I'm not talking about that fear. We're talking about the fear of eternity. Because a true believer who understands his position in Christ knows that he's going to be with God because of what Christ has done on the cross and not because of his own righteousness. Clear so far? Okay. I mean, this is super important. So we are no longer fear, no longer have fear. Rather, okay. on the other hand, on the opposite side, Rather, you, the Spirit you receive, brought about your adoption to sonship. Now, earlier in verse 14, Paul simply says that if you're the Holy Spirit, you are a child of God. But now in verse 15, Paul explained how did you become a child of God? Okay, how? By adoption. By adoption. Let's take a look. What is the word adoption? By definition, adoption is the action of legally. Attorney Borja, here again, legal na naman. Okay, legal. An action of legally 
taking another's child and bringing it up as your own. That is adoption. That's adoption. Now, here's a question. If you and I were adopted and the definition of adoption is that, we're, that we were brought into the family of God, the question is, but to whose family did we belong before? Because we were adopted. So who's, who's, who's family? Kayo nung anak ka, whose child are you? Well, the situation in the book of John, chapter 8, verse 44, when Jesus and the Pharisees were going back and forth, because the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were so proud that they were children of Abraham, and as a matter of fact, they had claimed, oh, the only father we have is God. Then in John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus tells them directly whose children they are. You belong to your father, who? The devil. The devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. Now, I, I don't know if you really have considered this. We always want to claim that we are children of God. And yes, we are, if we have the Holy Spirit. That's true. But what we don't realize is to whose family we belong to before we became the children of God. According to scriptures, you and I were formerly ex-children of the devil himself. You see? Wow. And yet, because of the love of God, he sent his son to die on the cross and gave us the righteousness of Christ to those who believe. And to those who believe, he gave them as a deposit the Holy Spirit to live in them that we might combat sin. And we are therefore also the children of God adapted into the family from the family of the devil. The spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And now here's the beauty. Because now that we are children of God, adopted children of God. By the way, we have to understand the first century Roman Empire adoption. You see, back then, adoption is not just a mere uh, adding a child to the family. The practice of the Romans in the first century, in the first century was that they adopted because there is no one in their family who is worthwhile to inherit. So they will adopt somebody whom they know can, quote unquote, continue the business, who can continue what, because sometimes people have children, even today, you have children who are not deserving. And you know that whatever you've accumulated will be, will be gone in a, few, in a few years. So it is a practice back then in particular, that they would adopt another child whom they know is worthwhile and is able to do whatever work has to be done and bypasses everybody else, his own children. That's the adoption that God has given us. God gave us that right. And because of that, and by him, who's the him? The Holy Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. You know the word Abba? Abba is not just a group, you know, the Abba, Abba singer. <laughs> Abba means daddy. It is the more impersonal way of calling your father. Right? Sometimes we call papi, okay, daddy, okay, dada. I mean, that's the info. This speaks about the closeness of relationship that we have with the father. He is not a God in a far distance, far, far away. No. He is in us through His Holy Spirit, and by His Holy Spirit, we can communicate to our Father as Daddy. Abba, Father. 16. Hold on, we're almost done, we're almost done. Last two verses. 16. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, this is in relationship to verse 17 that we can call on God as Abba because the Spirit Himself tells us testifies that we are truly children of God. Now, how do I explain that? It's really hard for me to explain. 
But you, as a true believer, if truly you have the Spirit of God, as Paul would like to use, if you truly have the Spirit of God, there is a testimony within you that you know you can approach God as your daddy, as your father. He is no longer somebody who's, who's so far away. He is really something, he is someone that is very personal to you, daddy, child of God. Verse 17. Now, if, <laughs> again, uh, Paul, Paul loves to use the word if, just to make sure that he wants uh, everybody to, to really consider, are they really a child of God? Do they really truly have the Holy Spirit? So now if we are children, here's the result. We are heirs. Wow. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Now what does an heir mean? What is the significance of an heir? That means you will inherit. There you go. You, you, you have the right to inherit what your parents will pass on to you. Heirs of God. Now, let us sink in for a moment. Sink in, let it sink in. We are heirs. That means whatever God has, which Christ has, you have. <laughs> see, see, see how much God loves us? He's not just going to take us away from hell. That's why you, you now have, we now need to have a better appreciation of the word grace. That we are going to receive not just salvation, but a lot of other inheritance that we do not deserve. And here's the condition. We are co-heirs when? Uh, let, let, let me explain uh, before I jump into the last sentence. So we are co-heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Let me jump to First Peter. Because First Peter explains what inheritance are we going to have. Verse 3 of chapter 1, First Peter. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So, we already know that, okay? Verse 4. And, okay, and, that means also, and into an inheritance. What kind of inheritance? What is it going to give to us? An inheritance that can never perish. What does that mean? You know, even if you and I had an inheritance of a million dollars, if we were going to live for eternity, a million dollars, not enough. <laughs> right, Bert? Not enough. I mean, no matter how much, even if you say a, a trillion dollars. Remember, this is for eternity. If you only have a trillion dollars, it's not enough. But the inheritance we are going to get, which did not say what, is an inheritance by description can never perish. It will never run out. Never ending. And never ending. Not only that. It will never spoil. Who knows that we will get an inheritance of lechon. But that lechon will never spoil. <laughs> of course, I'm kidding. But, but, but the point is, whatever that is inherited today in this world that will get spoiled, whatever God will give us will never spoil or never fade. Wow. Continue. Still first Peter. This inheritance is where? Kept in heaven for you. Now, here's the problem with many people. Many Christians have this problem that they think that today in this world, we will get everything that God has prepared. And so we expect a good life, a nice life, a comfortable life, a no problem life. You are dreaming, my friend, because the Bible says in this world, you will have trouble. But in the next world, in eternity, you will inherit things that are imperishable. Uh, what is that? Never spoil, never fade. And it is in heaven. How? Verse 5. Who through faith are shielded by God's power? That means it's protected. It's in a safe <laughs> 
Nobody can steal it. Nobody can get it. It is safe when we get to heaven. How? Until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. That means not now. Not now. It's still coming. Coming soon. Okay? Coming soon. So, this inheritance that we receive because we are in Christ, because the Holy Spirit lives in us, is something that is prepared by God in heaven which will be revealed. What's the word revealed? To be shown, to be, to be uh, given, to be made known, to be revealed in the last time. Now, there are things that I know that the Bible tells us that we will inherit. That is forever. will never spoil and never deteriorate. You know what this is? What it is? Anyone? The kingdom of God. No. No. Okay. Anyone in the room? What is one of the inheritance that we know that the scripture tells us that we will inherit in the last time? Ah, there you go. Korah. Glorified body. One of the inheritance, and in the context, the problem is the body. Remember? So one of the inheritance that we will receive from Christ in the last time, 1 Thessalonians 4, when Christ returns in the cloud and we are snapped out, raptured in a twinkling of an eye, and we will be transformed from our lowly bodies, from our mortal bodies to immortal bodies, which will never fade, never be corrupt. That is one of the inheritance. We are heirs of God and co-heirs of God. With Christ. So far, as Christians today, we, have, we know of at least one inheritance. Number one, the new self, the new man, which will never die. Okay, will never die. It is already right now in us, living in us, and that's you and I right now. And it's been made perfect, and that is for eternity. That's why there is now no condemnation. But the body will come soon. That's the next thing in line. When Christ returns and raptures the church, that is when we will receive our bodies. You see, when we receive our bodies, it is not just because we will, you know, I'll have my long hair and, uh, you know, all the wrinkles are gone. It, it's not just about the, 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 what the body can do. But more importantly, when we receive our glorified body, that body is no longer dwelt by sin. That is why it is immortal. That is why it will no longer perish. That is why it will no longer fade away. That body is for eternity. Then he says, if, <laughs> okay, if indeed we share in his sufferings. <clears throat> now what does that mean? Does that mean that you know, we are suffering? No, no, no. Remember, we share. Who's suffering? His suffering. This tells us, again, from Romans 7, that uh, Romans 6, that we have been baptized into Christ and baptized into his death. That is the suffering that this speaks about. In other words, if you are in Christ, then we share in his suffering, and this inheritance is a reality only for those who are in Christ. Then the last line, in order that, for the purpose of that we may also share in his glory. What glory? The being co-heirs with Christ. What God has given his son, Jesus Christ, is given to you and I. That's the final glory. Brothers and sisters, I don't know and I cannot make a list of the things that God has prepared for an inheritance for those who are in Christ to those who have the Holy Spirit in them. Corinthians tells us that no eye has seen and no ear has heard what the Lord has prepared for those who love him. I, I think for whole of eternity, we will be surprised by God of new things that God has prepared for us to inherit. Another inheritance, by the way, that scripture reveals. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. That new heaven and new earth will no longer fade, will no longer be polluted 
will always be, I don't know, I cannot describe it, but always be nice. and That is something that you and I will inherit as well. Wow. And there are a lot more because the ones I mentioned that are those only that are mentioned in scriptures. But Peter says the inheritance that are in heaven kept by God. That means only God will reveal it in the last days. In eternity. Amazing. And brothers and sisters, that is where we end chapter 8, verse 12 to 17.